Ed, you said you hadn't been down to this part of the bar before. No. And you know we're actually in the oldest part of the university. Obviously this is very old compared to, to the OU mm. lifespan. But one of the things that, that I think about, um, I think Derek does too, is how we deal with old stuff. That's my perspective. Mm. Um, I try and keep everything. I want to protect and preserve, but I know that's a really difficult thing. I mean, can we keep everything? I guess if we kept everything, the world just would be full of old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> There'd be no room for new stuff. What if it's good old stuff, though? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, I'm all in favour of old stuff. I do think there's, um, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, we, th we think it's valuable and you know, maybe rightly think it's valuable. But there's a really interesting question as to why we think, or what is valuable about old stuff? What is it about old stuff that makes it valuable? And also, who's we? Because mm. my old stuff, I'm very happy to be in a nice brick cellar, but it's not everyone, everyone's idea of a, a great place to be. So who are we as well? Mm. Who's the we saying? we should keep everything. Yeah, well, I think that goes to, to some questions about you know, how people identify you know, the, the, the uh, symbols or, or the kind of meanings that they attach to, to certain things. So if you look at countries, a lot of my research looks at you know, how states interact with each other in, in, in a particular part of the world. And so a country's national identity, for example, mm -hmm. might be based on you know, uh, ancient monuments, ancient artifacts that are really important to how they kind of perceive themselves and how they project themselves and their influence in the world, because mm -hmm. it tells a story about where they've been and, and you know, kind of who they are. So that's it, a very kind of macro, you know, broad scale. But um, I think it poses some interesting questions, especially when it comes to the sort of heritage of these yeah. you know, kind of objects and, and sites and, and, you know, how people interact with them. Um, yeah, in times of trouble or whatever, you know, it's really interesting. So I think that's something, I mean, I've grown up in Britain, so I've grown up, I think, in a culture that is really aware of its past. It's not easy to discuss in the present sometimes, no. but, you know, we know that uh, you can wander around and see prehistoric monuments. Um, you can go to some places and see Roman monuments. So we, we can see thousands of years of occupation uh, around us and I think nationally we've agreed to invest a lot in keeping it all going. We spend taxpayers' money on Stonehenge and everything and so we've got a sort of national agreement that that's generally a good thing I think. But actually, I know, Derek, you, you work in areas where there isn't an agreement about that at all. No, I, I think, I mean, even in the British context, it poses the question of, you know, we all agree old stuff's nice and valuable, but talking about public money, you know, the money yeah. could go into the NHS yeah. or it could go into old stuff. Um, we put it into old stuff, and that is at, you know, that is at a real cost because that means there are few operations that can be done at the NHS. And this is really, in the area in which I work, this has really become... Um, sort of salient now because in the past, oh, last December, December 2017, um, the British government ratified a UN convention, the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Artifacts, which means it's now a, um, a war crime for British soldiers to damage heritage in war zones. And this really does make the question of how valuable old stuff is really sharp because mm -hmm. And to give you a real example, the, um, when we were bombing the Libyans, um, somebody noticed that there was, the Libyans had put a lot of their um, military hardware around an old Roman fort. Mm -hmm. And usually they would just kind of flatten it, destroy the hardware, destroy the fort. But now they thought, right, okay, we've got to preserve this old stuff. Um, so they didn't flatten it, but rather they undertook a much riskier operation to destroy the things. So basically what we were doing there was saying, right, we're going to risk the lives of our soldiers in order not to destroy an old fort, mm. and which is probably which could could be fine, mm. but it really does mean that we do need a better account of what the value is of old stuff in order to be able to make yeah. these calculations. But can I just double check something with you? Did you say 1954? The Hague Convention was yeah 1954. Let's a couple take of protocols. Yeah, yeah, we've been so long. this long. <laughs> we we are the we were the last major military power to ratify it. Wow. So. I mean, this is the historian in me. What was going on in the 50s that, that made the Hague Convention even a good idea? I think it was still post-war stuff. So um, the, the, the destruction of uh, old buildings in, in Europe 
um, in the Second World War was sort of catastrophic, really. And yeah. so the, the, there was a general consensus that we should tr do what we can mm. to save these old buildings. Um, the trouble is the law is just really, really unclear. So, well, it's, not really, it's, it, it's clear in its words, it's just not clear what the words mean. So it says, uh, you're not allowed to destroy old stuff, except in cases of military necessity and if there's no viable alternative. But we don't know what a viable alternative is. So, mm. so would a viable, let me give you an example. Okay, so, so say you've got to transport some stuff through a war zone and there's a 5% chance you'll be attacked. Okay. Do you go over an ancient site or do you go through a town? There's only a 5% mm. chance you'll be attacked. Do you destroy this old stuff, take mm. a chance, or do you go through the town and put people's lives at risk? Mm. Now, these are calculations that people really have to make. Mm. And so while we can all agree that old stuff is valuable, we do need a more precise account yeah. of what the value is in order to be able to, for these calculations to, be, to make sense. That's quite scary when you put it like that, but uh, I suppose I would have to come back and say, who are we saving heritage for? So I know there are real lives in the generation to, to fight for and protect, but I suppose the really long-term view of heritage is actually it's, it's not for us to decide whether we trash it or not. We have a duty to hand it on, so there is another duty of care, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And the other thing as well, I mean, this is, you know, it happened throughout history, of course. We all know, you know, see the, um, how the Mongols sacked, you know, various, um, you know, um, areas within within the Islamic empires um, and it's happened throughout history also the other thing to, to, to think about here is that you know some groups I mean and, and you will have seen this with, with your recent research in the Middle East I'm sure that some groups it's like the so-called Islamic State group they, they they you know come from a position where this heritage is 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 not valued at all and actually mm. is, is seen as you know idolatrous and, and, mm. and against a very you know um, Kind of spurious and, and an extreme interpretation of Islam that they have, you know. So they, 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 the value is, is well, is, is there any value there at all? And hence why they, um, you know, kind of destroy it. Which is, you know, re I'm really interested to sort of hear your thoughts on that and what you kind of discovered in, in some of your trips out. Well, that, I guess that, that goes back to comments that uh, Susie was making earlier when she said, "Well, who are the we?" Because mm -hmm. you could, I mean, it, you could say, "Look, it's it's up to them what they do with their heritage." You know, here we are sitting in Milton Keynes, mm -hmm. pontificating about what people in the Middle East should yeah. do or should not do with their heritage. If they want to destroy their heritage, what's it got to do with us? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You're ah, well, <laughs> then I play the World Heritage Cards in time, um, which really dominates thinking uh, in, in anyone who works with heritage. You can't ignore the World Heritage Convention. 1972 is the date. And that was really um, a division of the UN so a global group of people coming together and saying, right, we are going to all stand up for protecting really a global sense of inheritance. And that's my point about, well, don't we have a duty to hand stuff on? Because you can make a decision now. It's very easy to, to destroy something, not just through war, but through neglect or really you know, radical uh, remodeling. And some things cannot ever be put back together. So, are you comfortable with that decision? Because we might look back and deeply, deeply regret some losses. I mean, there are famous losses in history. Um, you know, I think most of our classical studies colleagues would quite like to go and see many classical studies monuments that, you know, have, have been lost forever. And I think it's, it's not a modern day thing exactly to have this heightened awareness about what to keep, what to pass on, but it's really, it's become crystallised, I think, in the 20th century. And I'm sure that's part of the horror of World War II and World War I, in fact, and realising what globally we're capable of in the bad sense mm -hmm. and trying to put something positive to glue us back together. So in fact, heritage, I would argue, has a glue effect as well. It's another reason for for working with heritage. It's not just admiring pretty old stuff, it's about the social bonds it represents. Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't like I haven't the, convinced you, <laughs> have I? I think, there's, there's, I think there's something sort of, a, a bit of a, a, a false promissory note about that World Heritage Convention um, stance. Because it says, right, you know, that world, you know, heritage is all our concern, but what are we supposed to do about it? And there are people, there's a, a piece came out recently by um, uh, 
pair of writers called Weiss and Connolly, who argue that we should actually take military action to preserve heritage. Right. Now, it's quite radical. That is quite radical because you know wars are costly in terms yeah. of human lives and utter human misery and so on and so yeah. forth. But if we're not going to take military action to preserve heritage, then it just sounds as if these are a lot of kind of soft soap words. You know, heritage is our con everybody's concern, mm. but there's actually nothing we can do about it when people start to destroy it unless we are going to basically kill them. You put me in a really tight spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't stand up for the destruction of human life. That's true. I think, can I have some fuzzy grey areas in that case? I'm, I still think that's one reason, and I know that's what the interest that you have, Derek, that's one reason for people like us talking to the people who know how to do war, the soldiers, because um, I'm not going to go out with, in a battlefield and say, actually, I'm just going to stand in front of this ancient monument. Could you please not bomb me? Um, they're the ones you pointed that out. But that's why we've got to have a dialogue, haven't we? It isn't black and white. It isn't black and white at all. Yeah. Mm. I think sometimes as well it can also um, be a way in to tell the wider human story as well. So if you look at the examples from Afghanistan, the, the Bamiyan Buddhas that were blown up, actually, you know, some people might say, well, that's you know, a tragic loss. But actually, mm -hmm. the loss is the human life, the, the Hazara population who are a minority in Afghanistan, who have been persecuted, you know, throughout their history, uh, you know, a, a real, um, you know, really kind of suffered in that context as well. So uh, if it helps shine a light on, on yeah. that wide, those wider issues as well, then it can be useful. Mm -hmm. But some people might say, well, you know, what's the bigger kind of loss? Here, you know. I think I, I, it's tricky because I'm pulled both ways. I've been I've been pushing to say, look, you know, you've got to value human life more than heritage. But if somebody's got a flamethrower and they're standing in the Louvre, um, you know, and the only way to stop them blitzing the Louvre is to kill them, I'd probably kill them. That's a really dramatic point. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. That's Ooh. something we're going to have to think about, Derek. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pick it up again. Tomorrow. Come back to me on that <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs>